Hey, Hill City, welcome to our, uh, what is your Christmas morning? We're recording this on Christmas Eve Eve as we gather together corporately, and we're just gathered for our Christmas Eve service. And so if you're joining us online or re-watching because you missed it because of the cold weather or sickness, just want to wish you a Merry Christmas, and we hope that the day is going very well for you. Um, we're glad you're here in the midst of this busy season. Uh, whether you realize it or not, we're actually coming to the end of a historic time on the church calendar. We're coming to the end of a season called Advent. And Advent is a season that's celebrated in the weeks leading up to Christmas. And it looks back at the time when people were filled with hope, waiting for a Messiah. And then it also looks forward to the hope we have that our Messiah, Jesus, will return again righting all wrongs and restoring this broken world. So Advent is a time to look back, remember the hope they had for Jesus coming, and then to look forward to remember our hope for Jesus coming again. And so the first candle that you light for the season of Advent, because candles are lit every week leading up to Christmas Day, is the candle of hope. Let's read part of the Christmas story together from Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, 26 through 33 says this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The hopes of an entire nation through hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, vague prophecies and, and holding on to the promises of God was fulfilled in this moment through the visit of an angelic messenger to a girl, a simple Nazarene teenager in the backwater area of Galilee. She wasn't wealthy. Uh, nothing is said in the biblical account about Mary being uh, obscenely beautiful you know, and we don't get a plot twist where she's discovered to be royalty and a la Princess Diaries taken somewhere to learn pro proper etiquette before she gives birth to the king. No, she was in every way an obscure, normal person. Moreover, she was Jewish at a time where, much like today, uh, that was something that was often uh, criticized and ostracized. You were ostracized for, unfortunately and the Jewish people were discriminated against. They were being begrudgingly allowed to hold on to their traditions by the Roman Empire, but the Roman Emperor himself thought of himself as a god, as a deity, and so their religion made no sense to him. She was a normal, obscure woman, a nobody who would have led an obscure, hidden life except for this moment. There would have been no recording of Mary in the history books if not for this moment, if not for this visit, if not for this simple yes, the simple yes that she said to God. And because of that one yes, that one act of faithfulness, our entire world was changed. And of course, it might not have looked that way to the outside world, right? Some of us know this story so well, it's hard to remember that in Luke chapter two, as Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem because of a census, um, they are just another in the crowd. They're just another set of people being ordered around by uh, Ro Roman governance. One minuscule representative of an entire nation that's under the foot of Roman rule. They're nothing special, just another Judean family. And when Jesus is born and placed in a manger, we see the Prince of Peace. We've heard all the songs. We know who he is. But at that moment, what people would have seen was just another squalling, bloody infant born displaced to poor parents. They wouldn't have seen anything special. 
This was not front page news, not yet, right? But as so often it's true, God used the absolutely mundane to contain a miracle. The absolutely mundane to contain a miracle. Because that little baby was actually God with us, Emmanuel. The only one who could bring us back into relationship with God again. And so the second candle of Advent is lit, remembering that peace which Jesus brought and still offers to us today. The third candle of Advent that is lit is the candle of joy. And there's a lot of joy in this story, you might know. The joy of the news announced to Mary, the joy of baby John leaping in utero as his mom uh, meets Mary and finds out the news, the joy of the angel announcement to the shepherds, the joy of the shepherds running to see the newborn king, the joy of good news, or as we call it, the gospel, the joy of the gospel. God has entered our world, not as we would have expected, but as we most needed so that we could become his children. The writer of John puts it this way in 1, 9 through 12. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Light. There's a reason we put up Christmas lights this time of year, right? Or why the Celts danced around bonfires and the Germans lit candles and the Chinese lit fireworks. This time of year is dark and cold and depressing and it weighs heavily on the human heart. And so we light lights and we try to stay warm and we try to forget the darkness that we feel heavily. But God didn't shy away from the darkness. God didn't shy away from the darkness of the season or of the human heart. Instead, he entered the darkness to be with us. God stepped into that darkness for you and for me, for everyone who would become his children. And the reason for that is love, which is the fourth candle of Advent. John 1, 4 and 5 says this, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Has not. Will not. Even with the Romans then and people like them today, even with deeds of darkness and, and the toxicity of our own hearts, darkness cannot overcome that love. Because that baby born in such a normal, obscure way would also die in a way that hundreds of others had under Roman rule on a cross. But of all the men who died like that before him, why is it that we remember Jesus? Well, historians have argued that point for a long time, but I like what Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we remember that Jesus came into this world in obscurity and he's coming back again in power. The light hasn't left us. And for those of us who trust in his name and acknowledge him as Lord, we are filled with power to follow in his footsteps and to do the good work of the kingdom here and now, even in the darkness, even in the silence, because it won't, it has not, it will not prevail. Christmas is a remembrance of God's hope, peace, joy, and love. Hope that God has chosen, like Hannah said, the miraculous out of the mundane, that we are in on the story, and that our story has just begun. And peace, that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And if we could have given ourselves our own peace, we would have done so already. We need the Prince of Peace, 
to fight for us, to free us, to heal us, to bring us to a real place of peace. The word peace in the Hebrew was shalom, is shalom, which means completeness or well-being. And we hold the promise that one day we will, be com we will have complete peace and, and, and it will come. Joy. Joy is a hard one for me. I don't know how you feel, but joy is one I struggle with, especially during the holidays where I suffer a type of sadness, especially during Christmas. Uh, for many, I don't know for you, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, for some people face a loss of a dream or a loved one. That's something I'm going through now. Uh, for others, it's loneliness, um, maybe a broken relationship that's really amplified right now, or a traumatic experience that plays over and over again. It's important for us to remember that Jesus faced things like us, faced life like us. And he says to us in John 17, 13, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they, that's we, his followers may have joy, a full measure of my joy within them, and joy that is full. Finally, Hannah said, love, that I'm seen by God who loves me and sacrificed for me so we can live with him forever and ever. So today we light the final candle. I think I will light it. Light. Maybe I won't light it. Oh, there we go. Fancy, fancy. That is the Christ candle. In Matthew 1, 23, it writes, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Simply, that is the, what is going on. Christmas means God with us with us, that the eternal, ultimate being who created and holds all things together has become a human being and is with us. Jesus is God and he is with us. And this changes everything, especially to those, those that God invited to this event, uh, letting them know that the prophecy is being fulfilled right in front of them, that, that he is the one that they've been waiting for. And God is not distant, like many people felt. God has not forgotten them. Rather, God is here, and he personally invites them into the story. God with us. But who is this us, right? Who does God come to be with? It is not with the elite, nor the powerful, nor the prestigious, or the religious leaders. Rather, it was shepherds who... The entire world, were they, they, they thought they were forgotten people, outcasts of the family or the lower class. Uh, and you can say today they were the migrant workers, the immigrants, the poor and the powerless, the humble, the nameless. Maybe that's how you feel. These were the people on God's heart. Think about that. Shepherds living in the fields at night, keeping watch over the flock. And God sent his host, his group, his posse of angels, inviting them into the inauguration of the birth of Christ into the storyline of humanity with the message, do not be afraid. And maybe you're afraid today. Maybe you're full of anxiety today. God is telling the shepherds, and maybe he's ringing true in your heart. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Think of the significance. Good news for great joy. The other night, I was out with a group of guys, and we were, uh, we were eating like a Christmas meal together with the, these guys that we do discipleship with. And two of the friends decided to tip the waitress huge. I mean huge. I mean something I would not do, but they did. And I was like, oh, that's surprising. But her response was so amazing. She was shocked. A blessing that caused an emotional like response. She was so humbled, overwhelmed by the gift. She needed it. She even began to hug everyone at the table. And I mean, I didn't pay for it, but I got to receive the actions of my friends. Imagine that feeling of that girl felt, feeling, uh, feel that feel, hold that gratitude with me. 
Now the shepherds felt like that, but 2,000 fold as they were invited into this greatest birthday of all time where they saw heaven and earth ripped together and angels moving in between and they were in on it. Now what does that mean to us today in our lives, in our craziness, in our busyness, our stress, our, 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 our busy and our moment? God cares for us, for us you so much so that he became a man to draw near to us yes for his glory but also for our peace our hope our joy our love that is no small arrangement to look over right we should ruminate on what god was doing and god is doing remember this brennan manning in the ragamuffin gospel He writes, my deepest awareness of myself that I am, my deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ and I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. I wish we could let that just settle down. To live by grace means to recognize that my whole story in my virtue and in my sin, in my light and in my darkness, that God's grace and affection is still for me, not because I'm good, not because I deserve it, but because God is good and he has invited me into his story. You and I are loved by God and he is with us. Shepherds, outcast, rich, poor, divorced, single, married, near, far, whole, or broken. Christmas means God is close to us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know where people stand today. I don't know what they're going through or what they're thinking or if they need peace or they're full of gratitude. But I pray, let us be reminded and let us hold that gratitude in our heart during Christmas time. That as we think of you, we remember uh, just the, the hope and the peace and the joy and the love. But that you are with us even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and God bless your Christmas time.